Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Horner. I'm the Director of Education at Emory's Michael C. Carlos Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program in conjunction with the exhibition, Wondrous Worlds, Art and Islam Through Time and Place. One of the things I love about the exhibition, Wondrous Worlds, is the way it explores both the long history and the vast geographic expanse of the Islamic world featuring contemporary works alongside pieces from as early as the ninth century and covering territory from Morocco to Indonesia. Like the exhibition, our speaker tonight and her subject will connect us through the generations, the centuries and across continents. We are delighted to welcome Emory University alumna, Melody Moise, Moise, a graduate of both Emory School of Law and School of Public Health, an activist, an attorney, an assistant professor of creating write, creative writing at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Melody's writing has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, on NBC News, in the Yale Journal of the Humanities and Medicine, and she is the author of Haldol and Hyacinths, A Bipolar Life, and War on Error, Real Stories of American Muslims, for which she was named the 2007 Georgia Author of the Year. The subject of tonight's program is her latest book, The Rumi, the Rumi Prescription, How an Ancient Mystic Poet Changed My Modern Manic Life, published in 2020 by Penguin and out just last week in paperback and available through the Carlos Museum's bookshop. As a child, Melody's father, a phys physician, used to leave Rumi's poems around the house for her, written on pages from his prescription pad. While the run-on couplets of the mystical Sufi poet reminded Melody's father of the Iran he both loved and fled, for her they were of another time and place, not germane to her American experience. It was not until Melody experienced a psychotic breakdown and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder that the words of the poet touched her, electrifying her experience, offering visions and connecting her with the divine. Tonight, she will share how her break with reality led her to a transcendent mysticism, and she'll also discuss her experiences with the U.S. medical system. Melody, thank you so much for joining us tonight and for sharing your relationship with Rumi, and I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I'm so happy to be here. Should I take it from here? Take it from here. Take it from here. Good deal. Um, so thank you so much to all of you who've actually shown up. It looks like there's 95 people here. Um, one of the benefits of doing this uh, from on Zoom, there are a few, but one of them is that people can come from wherever they are. So I'm really happy about that. I really wanna thank Elizabeth uh, and everyone at the Carlos Museum who helped make tonight possible. Uh, I am deeply honored to be giving this Wondrous Worlds lecture on the Rumi prescription, especially as a proud Emory alum. and. For the record, I should say I am here tonight to talk about love because that is exactly what Rumi would want. Um, and I have a confession though, uh, love is not my forte. Uh, anger is and always has been the thing that I am best at. Uh, it has driven my entire career path. Uh, it's why I went to Emory, it's why I went to law school. Uh, it's why I write and I have, have written for a long time and it for a long time led my career path in a way that was productive. And I believe that anger is productive. Um, and I still to this day wake up angry at the state of the world and eager to change it. Um, but anger can only carry you so far until it, it starts to burn you up from inside, right? Um, and that is basically what happened. I ended up in a psychiatric hospital. Um, obviously, I had a psychiatric medical condition that needed treatment as well. But uh, I, I think carrying around that anger for so long was not helpful. Uh, and that, to give you a sense of sort of where I'm coming from, I think it'll help to just tell you a little bit about this book and then read a bit from it, just a page or so. Um, I should say the book itself is broken down into different chapters. There are 10 chapters. Each one is a different diagnosis and a different prescription. Uh, based. The prescriptions are based on Rumi's uh, poetry and the diagnoses are uh, basic human emotions, some of which have a clinical manifestation, most of which don't. I mean, I guess maybe a lot of them have clinical manifestations, but uh, I'm not talking about the clinical kind uh, exclusively by any stretch. Uh, so when I'm talking about depression, I'm also talking about sadness as well. So um, 
my experience in terms of writing this book, I decided later in my life after taking Rumi for granted my entire life, taking my dad for granted, who is the person who has been reciting it to me most my entire life. Um, he is a physician by trade, uh, but he is a connoisseur of Sufi poetry by tradition uh, in Iran where he grew up. And uh, that is how our house was in Ohio where I grew up. Uh, so that poetry was a constant sort of background. And the, it was something like a lot of kids, you know, I just took it for granted. It was something I, the wisdom of my father was not something I came to recognize until I was probably 30. So uh, that's a little bit of the background. The section that I wanted to read on being an expert in anger is, is the section on anger. Uh, so that is, if anybody has the book, that is on page 156, is where I'm starting at the bottom of 156. The safest and most effective way to overcome oppression is not out of revulsion for our enemies, but out of devotion for our friends. When we focus our love and empathy for the oppressed, when we focus on our love and empathy for the oppressed instead of on our anger and enmity for the oppressor, we liberate ourselves from the pitfalls of ego and outrage. And in doing so, we pave the way for an enduring, inclusive, and accessible path toward justice. This isn't me, <laughs> this isn't me being noble or gracious, uh, as I'm inherently quicker to anger than to love. This is me being practical. The greater and more deeply entrenched any injustice happens to be, the higher the likelihood that we'll have to convert some enemies into friends in order to uproot it. That's just math. I'm not suggesting we love all our enemies to the point of failing to protect ourselves, far from it. I'm all for defending ourselves and others in the face of oppression. I just think we ought to be smart about it. To that end, it's worth recognizing that everyone needs love, friends and enemies alike, and that most people who perpetuate injustice don't do it because they want to be cruel, but rather because they want to be loved. It's just that somewhere along the line, they forgot that they were born loved and then proceeded to conflate love with power, money, fame, privilege, or all of the above. Once we recognize the pitiful confusion, longing, and insecurity that drives so many oppressors, we can start being more strategic about how we oppose them and quit pretending that fury alone can produce meaningful change. Outrage, after all, is not a viable public policy. Love, on the other hand, is. Love commands us to see ourselves in others and others in ourselves, while outrage commands us to see ourselves as superior to others and others as inferior to us. And the more purportedly righteous our indignation, the more it relies on a relentless dichotomy between us and them. Unlike anger and arrogance, however, Love doesn't revel in rank or righteousness. Love is free from ego. Magnify love and you get justice. Magnify anger and you get injustice. Rumi says, and I translate, justice waters trees at the, rather, justice waters trees that bear fruit. Injustice waters, waters thorns at the roots. Bestow bounty where it belongs, no matter where it arose. Don't just go watering everything that grows. Um, so I'm here tonight to water the trees of devotion over the thorns of indignation. Uh, but to do that, I have to tell you a bit about how I got here. So um, as I mentioned, I'm very good at anger. Uh, I've been an activist since I was a kid and that's what drove my activism. I um, staged my first protest when I was seven years old to get the ice cream man to come to our neighborhood because I thought it was a grave giant injustice that he would not. We lived on a very steep hill in Dayton, Ohio, and he was afraid that his truck would break, but he would go to all the other neighborhoods around us. So we were always like going through the backyards trying to find him because you could hear the music, right? So we were following the music and we would never get there. It was torture. So anyway, I gathered all the local stakeholders, meaning the neighborhood kids, which I think it was three, maybe four. I might be making up that fourth person. Um, very few of us. We ended up going to the bottom of the hill when we knew because we knew his route because of the music. Um, and we went to the bottom of the hill and I had a sign that said, ice cream man, wouldn't you once you? 
Uh, we lived on Wooden Shoe Lane uh, and he ended up coming. He, it was probably the most successful endeavor I have ever had as an activist. Uh, it's also probably the easiest thing I've actually, uh, easiest cause I've sort of taken up. I just read that somebody is here from Dayton. Uh, so yeah, so supposedly, if you want to go to Wooden Shoe Lane, it's like the it's close to the intersection of Alex Bell um, and Mad River. That's where it is. It's been a long time. So I he ended up coming to our neighbor. I mean, that was huge, and I, I was hooked after that. I just thought I I have so much power. I can do this at seven years old, um, and I thought you know if you're interested in any sort of justice, what you're supposed to do. And I was one of those kids who. Um, everyone always came would tell me like you should be a lawyer and you know p.s like nobody ever says that as a compliment but but i took it as one i 100 percent took it as one and i ended up going to law school uh because i was inter interested in justice and i wanted to learn how our legal system worked turns out it works like garbage it works really badly um and i'm so grateful for the education to be able to navigate the system uh but practicing law just was not for me even after graduating and passing the bar uh it was something that was the the legal system just apart from being unjust also moves very slowly and i am very impatient uh this is me trying to speak slowly for instance um so i'm not a naturally slow speaker i try uh but i i obviously don't succeed that much but uh the thing about the law is you can change the law right and and ideally people follow it but doesn't doesn't mean they have to. And for those of us in the South, like obviously we're very familiar uh, with uh, Jim Crow, uh, as well as for those of us all over the United States. Uh, and if you're not from the United States, by the way, Jim Crow is this system that lives on through our drug war and mass incarceration. So again, you can change the law, try and achieve equality through that. And it just, it doesn't always work. Uh, the thing about writing for me is I realized that you can change people's minds and win them over for life, right? Like you don't need to change the law. And to me, that was power. And uh, it was one thing, there are very few things I'm good at. One of them is writing um, and the uh, like hula hooping is another, <laughs> like I, I wasn't gonna change the world through hula hooping though I've tried PS, uh, go ahead and Google it. Uh, but for me, writing is a spiritual and a revolutionary act. Uh, which is another way of saying it is a jihad. Uh, and for the record, jihad means struggle, not holy war. Um, there is nothing holy about war in Islam, uh, never has been. Uh, this idea of struggling against oppression is the basis of uh, jihad. And it's st struggling against the oppression within yourself, meaning the ways that we oppress ourselves and the divine within each of us. Uh, and that is known as the greater jihad. And then there's fighting oppression in the world, which is known as the lesser jihad. The reason reasoning for this is because fighting the oppression within yourself is the hardest. Um, that said, these are two sides of the same coin. So that ideally, the more you fight for justice in the world, the better you become at fighting it, fighting for it um, in your own soul, right? And fighting against the kinds of oppression that we put upon ourselves, for instance. Um, so the Prophet Muhammad uh, said, these are sayings of the Prophet, that the ink of a scholar is holier than the blood of a martyr. And another one of these sayings or hadith is, the highest jihad is speaking truth in the face of an unjust leader. So these two hadiths uh, basically represent the way that I relate to Rumi most as a writer. Um, I, I doubt he would come up and say, these are the ones that I'm, I'm upholding, but I think they absolutely are the ones that he's upholding as a writer. Um, and what he did through his writing and through his poetry was to speak truth to unjust leaders. And uh, certainly his ink was holier than the blood of any martyr. Uh, so all of that said, first though, we should get some facts right. Um, for anybody who might not be familiar, Rumi, uh, also known as Molana, which is uh, in Farsi what we call him, which means our master. That's to give you a sense of um, how respected and revered he is uh, throughout the Persian speaking world in Iran and far beyond that. Uh, and, and it's important that you know that he was a devout Muslim. Uh, the reason I say this is not because it's, he would want you to know that immediately, because I don't think he would. 
Uh, but given the world that we live in and given the level of discrimination Muslims around the world are facing, whether it's in the United States or in China or in Myanmar or in India, uh, it's worth saying that because it turns out Rumi is also, by many accounts, the best-selling poet in the United States, right? Um, so this best-selling poet, who is all over Instagram, by the way, if you're not there, uh, it turns out a lot of Americans don't know that he's Muslim and that he's not presented as a Muslim. Uh, a lot of the translations of his work tends to erase Islam out of that. So it's important for me, and it was important for me in this book, to bring it back in a way that was respectful and to, to what his purpose was. Uh, he was also, per like me, he was also Persian, um, uh, born in what is now Afghanistan. Uh, so Afghanis and Iranians have like extensive fights about who owns Rumi. Uh, which I'm sure he would find amusing because we all own him. He's, he belongs to all of us. Uh, but he was also a refugee and a jihadist in the truest sense of the world, word. Um, he spent a lot of his life fleeing war um, in devastation uh, and ended up at the end of his life in Konya in Turkey, where his shrine is and where he's buried. Uh, to give you a sense of his work, he, he is his masterpiece, which is known as the Quran in Persian, uh, is called the Masnavi, uh, which is rhyming couplet, couplets of uh, deep spiritual meaning is a sort of general translation of that. Uh, and it's six volumes of more than 25,000 rhyming couplets. So it's a lot. Uh, when I say my dad was reciting this stuff to me all the time, it's because there's so much available. <laughs> There's so much material. And he wrote about like every animal you can imagine. And all of his poetry is basically through examples, whether they're examples of people or prophets uh, or animals. Uh, he, uses, he uses all of that. Um, and a lot, a lot of animals, a lot more. And there's some mass navies for kids that, that sort of focus on the animal stories, which are great. Uh, he also wrote the Divan Shams, which is in honor of his teacher, his guide, his sheikh, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, Shams. Uh, so he, he wrote this, uh, mostly the Divana Shams is uh, quatrains and also ghazals, which if you're unfamiliar with that are basically a kind of sonnet, uh, but not, they're not. They're their own thing. Look it up if you don't know what it is. They're totally their own thing. Um, and people in plenty of different languages, poets are write ghazals. So look it up. Uh, G-H-A-Z-A-L, I think is how you spell it in English. So for Rumi, ultimately, and the reason I say I'm here to talk about love is because for him, God is love. Uh, furthermore, for the record, God also has no gender for Rumi. Uh, this is, which is very easy in Farsi because there, is, there are no gendered pronouns in Farsi. And one of the difficult things in writing this book was referring to God as the beloved, which is how Rumi refers to him. And then uh, with, a, so I use a capital B, the, that structure doesn't really work in Farsi, but the uh, referring to the beloved, I never wanted to say he, um, and in Farsi, I never have to, uh, because everyone is it. There's no he or she. Uh, so it works really well. It's very convenient if you're trans, like this is a great language for you. Um, by the way, like the, 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 a lot of other things, the government pays for trans uh, surgeries and therapy and stuff like that, which is like a total separate tangent that I'm running off on now, I guess. Um, but obviously there's a lot of other problems because it's considered, I'm not even gonna go into it, it's a lot. But um, the idea, the reasoning for bringing all of this up uh, is to say that for Rumi, God is too big for not just one gender, but also one religion. Uh, God created us differently, that's his thing. Um, and he did it intentionally, right? Um, the Quran says that we made you into different tribes and nations so that you may know one another. That is Islam. That is the only source of revela revelation within Islam is the Quran. And it tells us that we made you into different tribes and nations intentionally so that you may know one another and not, not hate one another, right? The, the idea is to love one another. Um, and, and again, like my instinct, just like Rumi's instinct is to, ne instinct is to never talk about religion overtly as anything other than the religion, what Rumi calls the religion of love. Um, and he does very much, much of his poetry. I mean, when I say the Quran in Persian, there are lines in Arabic where he actually is just pulling directly from the Quran. There are other lines where he literally is just translating the Quran into Farsi. 
Um, and by the way, if you're unfamiliar, Farsi and Persian are the same. Um, when I say those, it's, you can interchange them. It's the language we speak in Iran and other parts of the world also speak it in Azerbaijan, uh, different places as well. And in America, we speak in Wilmington, North Carolina, we speak it too. Uh, so in any case, the, the reasoning for bringing that up again is just the discrimination that we're all facing. Um, and for Rumi, unlike me, uh, he was all about this greater jihad, this internal jihad in the Masnavi and both and in the Divan uh, That is what he's good at. Uh, by contrast, as I said, that is not what I've been good at my entire life. I've been good at this lesser jihad, this fighting um, oppression in the world. My first book was about young Muslim Americans. I wrote it while I was in law school at Emory and I uh, wrote it entirely as a result of 9-11 because I was pissed about the way that Muslims were being represented uh, in, in the media, particularly in the United States um, and Europe as well. In any case, that it was an effort to fight Islamophobia overtly, an effort to basically say I interviewed and wrote about uh, a dozen young Muslim Americans, and the effort was to say, hey, look, we're human. It was really that simple, that book. Um, my second book was a memoir about having bipolar disorder. The effort behind that was to, one, to help people who have mental health conditions feel less alone, uh, certainly people from different uh, diverse backgrounds like mine, um, and to fight, so to fight ableism and sanism, the discrimination against those living with mental health conditions. So again, lesser jihad, I'm fighting for others, like for the outside world. That my, and that was my entire career before I, I wrote The Rumi Prescription. So that, that's where I'm coming from in approaching a book like this, where I am learning Rumi's poetry um, in order to write this book. And the book for the record is like 99% probably memoir about my effort to try and apply these, my, my not, I'm not so great at it, um, but I get better throughout the book and I've gotten better since it's been published um, to just apply these lessons to my life, right? Uh, and learning Rumi's poetry as I lived and wrote the book woke me up to the fact that the most powerful weapon in our arsenal against injustice is love, not anger. Um, so justice is everything for me and as I mentioned, it's why I write, it's why I speak, it's why I teach, it's why I do all of this. But again, anger was that primary motivator until at 29, I lost my mind. Um, I, at, that enabled me to fin finally connect with Rumi's poetry in a way I never was able to before. Um, and as I mentioned, my father is sort of a Rumi addict. Uh, and like most children of addicts, I grew up resenting the object of my uh, parents' addiction, and, and for my dad, certainly that was Rumi. Um, and because what happened for me was, what happens for a lot of people with mental health conditions, um, more than probably feel comfortable talking about it, is that I had a manic episode, and that overlapped with a mystical experience. And I hadn't slept for about two nights, uh, which recipe for mania. I didn't know I had bipolar disorder. I wasn't diagnosed at the time. Uh, so I might have known better if I, if I had a proper diagnosis. I had been misdiagnosed like so many people, like the vast majority of people in this country who have uh, bipolar disorder. I was mis originally misdiagnosed with, uh, and it varies in terms of what that misdiagnosis is, but mine was unipolar depression, uh, which can be incredibly dangerous because I was given antidepressants uh, which can actually exacerbate bipolar disorder, um, the, particularly the SSRIs. So I was actually being given medication that made my condition worse. And then on top of that, didn't sleep for a couple nights. Um, so a lot of things came together. Uh, and I found myself on my balcony in Decatur, uh, watching the sunrise over Stone Mountain. And I had this sense that just, I felt every ray just permeate every cell in my body. And I felt more connected to every other living thing, not just human, just like every other thing with cells as well. I felt so connected. Um, and, and I also, and I, I knew like there was something inside of us that was the same, whether it was me or a tree, right? Like I could tell that there was something. And I had this weird like insight into it that had nothing to do with intellect, which is a lot of what my life was <laughs> up until then. Uh, all about, right? 
Um, and so this experience, I didn't know it at the time. Uh, Sufis, the, the mystics of Islam, like Rumi, they have a word for this. They call it fana, uh, which means the annihilation of the ego. Uh, and I experienced it maybe for like 10 minutes <laughs> and it was, it was too much. It burned me. Uh, I ended up, my mystical experience quickly turned clinical. Uh, and I, as somebody, you know, mystics prepare for something like that. I had no preparation um, at all. Uh, I was I was deeply unprepared. I had not, they do, you know, meditation and fasting and all this stuff that I was not doing in order to pray. This was just stumbling upon um, this mystical experience. And that for me, this, this combination of something that was both a clinical and a mystical uh, spiritual experience at the same time was difficult. And it's difficult for a lot of people with mental health conditions because we are told by our society that basically, you know, the medical establishment tends to have this leaning of that's delusion <laughs> um, or superstition. Like it's some, it's part of your pathology as opposed to this is a gift you were given as part of this condition that has a lot of bad things that go with it, there's this beautiful gift you are given. And they tell us to throw that one good thing that came from it away, which seemed horrifying to me, which is basically what happened to me in the hospital. Um, it took me a long time to figure out that uh, these, these states were not mutually ex exclusive, right? That I could have a clinical condition that needed medication and treatment that was also a door into spiritual experiences. Uh, and that I, co I could have both of these things. I didn't have to choose. Uh, and when I say, you know, the medical establishment had that reaction, then there was the reaction of my faith community and other faith communities, which is basically um, the clinical side is invalid, right? This is just a spiritual problem. It's always a problem. You must be possessed. Some uh, Muslims suggested that I it was jinn. If you don't know what that is, Google it. I'm not gonna go into it. It's a long, explanation and I, I've already done enough tangents tonight, but, um, but yeah, so they thought I was possessed. So just in uh, plenty of people within Muslim traditions, within Catholic traditions, within plenty of other religious traditions, unfortunately are subjected to these uh, exorcisms. And I'm very grateful that I wasn't, both my parents are physicians. So they recognized very quickly that this was a medical condition that needed treatment. But when I say that uh, Rumi's poetry connected me and, that, and that's when I started connecting with his poetry, um, I wanna recite a couplet that I translated as, your wounds may summon the light here too, but this sacred light, it does not come just from you. Um, so this idea that our wounded self is also our most sacred self. It is the thing that pulls the beloved to us. And anybody who's dealt with illness, I think can confirm this for a lot of people. Um, that's what brings some of us to the beloved. And, and certainly it was something that helped bring me to the beloved, but I hadn't, I hadn't figured that out. I wasn't like, I, I definitely wasn't happy with the fact that I, I appeared to have some new condition that was, you know, they told me for the rest of your life, you're gonna have this and you're gonna have to take medication and it's very serious. And, uh, decent percentage of people with this condition end up dying by suicide. So like, it wasn't a thrilling prospect for me. Uh, and, and, and at the time I was deeply unaware of it. I ended up having um, a psychotic break. So I, from this manic episode, it morphed. And as part of the manic episode became the psychotic break that um, as so psychosis is part of mania for some people, um, including me and hallucinations and delusions entered the picture. Um, I thought I was a prophet. I thought I was a high level advisor to Barack Obama. I thought I had won the lottery. I thought I could fly, uh, which became deeply inconvenient uh, because that balcony I was telling you about was on the 20th floor of an apartment complex uh, on Claremont Road. Uh, so not, you don't wanna be on the 20th floor uh, of an apartment complex and have that delusion that you can fly because I really believed it. And, uh, my husband, not knowing what to do at the time, ended up calling the police. For the record, if you if you deal with us, if, if you are dealing with a mental health emergency uh, in yourself or somebody else, I highly advise you not call the police and that you call a mobile crisis unit. And if, as in many localities, ends up happening, they still transfer you to the police, uh, I encourage you to ask for a CIT officer 
that is somebody who is trained in dealing with mental health emergencies. It's important for me to say that uh, because this is a life or death situation. People have lost their lives because of this, because it's unfair to police and it's unfair to us as people living with these conditions that they are the ones who, who are sent to deal with a psychiatric crisis. Uh, and I was very lucky. I was lucky that I was hospitalized and not arrested, uh, let alone killed, which again happens to people because this is a country where we have effectively criminalized mental illness. Um, our largest mental health facilities in the United States are jails and prisons. Uh, so I was lucky to be in the hospital. That said, it was the most dehumanizing and humiliating experience of my entire life. Um, I, I can't overstate the use of the, the use of, I, I should say I had, I had a pancreatic tumor. Uh, so when I was younger, random, weird. And I know, and as a teenager, I almost died. And as a result of this, so I have spent lots of time in hospitals. Uh, I ended up having surgery and then I had many bouts of pancreatitis, which was very funny for my doctors because it's common in alcoholics and I don't even drink alcohol. Uh, so they're fascinated by it. And it was a very weird tumor that I ended up having. It was a very rare benign tumor that happens in adolescent Japanese girls, which I am not, was not at the time. So in any case, uh, the experience of that means that I had something to compare this to. I was, it's not like I was going into a psychiatric facility and I'd never been in the hospital. I know that hospitals are dehumanizing. <laughs> like they take away your pants, you know? I get it, it's totally dehumanizing and humiliating. I did not enjoy my time in the hospital for my pancreatic tumor, for sure. But I want to be clear that the experience in the psychiatric hospital was a different planet compared to that. There were restraints, there were strip searches. Um, and, and in addition to the dehumanizing things that were done to me, there were also dehumanizing things in terms of what was left out in my life. Um, so if you're in a psychiatric hospital, chances of there being music, um, not high, despite the fact that music is shown to be very uh, therapeutic for a lot of conditions. Um, if you start dancing, forget it, like symptomatic. If you start praying too much, symptomatic. I prayed maybe three times a day and, it, and they had marked me in my file as being hyper-religious. Uh, and I, I'm sure that had a lot to do with the, the way that they saw me pray. Uh, but no, so no music, no big thing, no windows. Like these seem like small things. That's a huge thing. Imagine going to the hospital and being given no, there's no windows. And even if you're not in solitary, <laughs> there's very rarely any windows. One of the facilities had windows. I mean, it's like a jail. And that was the kinds of windows that we were uh, allowed. Uh, and I was held for just 24 hours in uh, what I call solitary confinement, not seclusion, not isolation, not segregation, not any of the euphemisms people use for it, but solitary confinement because that's what it is. Um, and it's important for me to bring that up because this is, uh, in the United States, we use solitary more than any other country on the planet. We use it for treatment and for punishment, despite the fact that it has been proven to not only uh, be ineffective in, for, for both of these things, but counterproductive. It actually induces symptoms of mental illness in people who don't already have it. Uh, so that's how we're treating uh, mental illness in this country. And that, that was something that it, even in my state of being delusional and psychotic, I could feel it. I could tell what that what was happening to me, and it it is a kind of suffocating of the human spirit, and it is a kind of torture of the human mind. And that fact that we use it as a treatment for people who are in mental health crises is criminal, and and should be prosecuted. It's not something that we should do in this country or anywhere in the world. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure how many of you know that the United States uses this more than any other country in the planet, which is why it's important for me to say that. Um, and that people in prisons are held for years. Uh, so I just, it's important to, to mention that. And I, I wanna say, in addition to this idea of my overlapping clinical and spiritual experiences, as I mentioned before, I am not special. That's not something that like, I'm the only one who's ever experienced this by any stretch. The, the spiritual and psychiatric crises can overlap. And in many cases they do, not always, certainly. Um, but it happens enough that this is something we need to start paying more attention to. 
uh, because many of us who are living with mental health conditions are also mystics in the making uh, who are stunted by an American mental health system that is cruel and dehumanizing. Um, this is ultimately how we treat the mystics in our society. Some of the most spiritually gifted people among us, right? Poets, artists, saints, like these are people who, who we should be listening to and instead we're sort of throwing them away. Um, and, and we're people certainly not to say that we don't need medical treatment, certainly need medical treatment, but we also need spiritual encouragement um, and far too often we just get neither. And I, it's worth saying that were Rumi alive today, he composed most of his poetry while um, whirling in ecstatic states. He was the first of the so-called whirling dervishes. Um, so yeah, just imagine, and, and you sing this poetry in Persian. So he's singing and spinning in the streets. <laughs> like this is not something that you could just do in any, in the middle of the street and not get taken away. <laughs> Uh, in, in the United States today. So I, I don't doubt that it's entirely possible that were he alive today, that he might be hospitalized. Um, so the experience of losing my mind and being hospitalized ultimately connected me with Rumi's poetry and taught me that mental illness, among other things, is not limited to the clinically insane, um, which I was, and I'm admitting it here. Uh, the psychiatric hospitals and the use of solitary confinement were 100% proof of this because ultimately that mental health system is, remains, was and remains far crazier than any of us who are ever dragged through it. Um, so I, this is the, I'm just doing all of this as setup. This is this systemic madness and this dehumanization uh, is where I was at when my father was visiting me in the hospital and reciting this poetry to me. One of the hospitals I was in was in Ohio and it was a hospital where my father was a doctor. So I had this huge privilege that he would be able to visit me every day in that hospital, which the other patients did not get, unfortunately. They, visitors in psychiatric hospitals, it's not the same as other hospitals. You don't get visitors uh, as much at all. So one of the poems that he recited to me uh, in the hospital is, the Persian is, Ashiram man bar fan divanagi, siram as far hangi o far zonagi. And my translation for those who don't speak Persian, in love with insanity, I'm fed up with wisdom and rationality. Um, and it's not just in love with insanity, in love with the profession of insanity is, is literally what he's saying. Um, so madness is a sign of divine, of a divine gift in, in this sense. Uh, but for Rumi, he, he gets that there are two kinds of madness. This is, he distinguishes there's one kind of madness that is rooted in love. And that's the kind of madness that creates a mystic. There is another kind of madness that is rooted in fear. And that's the kind of madness that creates a lunatic or a fundamentalist, right? Uh, that's the basis of all fundamentalism and extremism is this madness rooted in fear that unfortunately in some cases ends up being portrayed as the ultimate sanity, uh, which it's not, P.S. Um, so Rumi got this and he got the, insanity is not exclusive uh, to the insane, that we are all crazy anyway. And so he tried to push us as human beings toward the right kind, uh, the kind that is rooted in love because the world we're living in is insane as it is. And to not be mad within it, good luck, try. Um, but if you're going to be, he says, go toward this madness that's rooted in love. And he understood that in leading with love uh, in the face of fear and depression and anger and anxiety and disappointment and all of the troubling emo emotions that are just inherent to the human condition that I call in the book diagnoses, uh, requires us to embrace all of our emotions, not just as guests, but as sacred teachers. So there is probably the most popular translation or, or po poem in English in translation of uh, Rumi's is known as the guest house. It's actually from the Masnavi uh, he didn't have titles for his poems, so it was that's what it's known as, or in Farsi, Mehman Khan it. And so my translation of this poem, where he advises us to imagine ourselves as human, as being like guest houses. He says, welcome every guest, no matter how grotesque, be as hospitable to calamity as to ecstasy, to anxiety as to tranquility, 
Today's misery sweeps your home clean, making way for tomorrow's felicity. So for Rumi, there's something to learn from every emotion, including and especially fear. Uh, it may seem counterintuitive, but in order to lead with love, we need to quit running away from fear and discomfort and start sitting with it. Not so we can overcome it. It's a wonderful American concept of trying to overcome everything. You cannot overcome fear and discomfort for the rest of your life. Like there's no overcoming it. It, it is part of the human condition. You are going to feel all of these emotions, but you, what you can do uh, is learn and grow and heal from those emotions, right? Uh, because what you're feeling right now is exactly what you need to be feeling. Unless you're trying to fight your natural emotions, which plenty of us do, right? So Rumi's message is not be positive, right? Like that's totally not his message. His message is be you. Feel what you are feeling and know that it's a gift. Because for Rumi, he says that honey is only sweet because you've tasted vinegar, right? It, it's not sweet in isolation. You, you will never know how sweet is it, it is unless you've tasted vinegar. And P.S. I love vinegar. The, sour is like very important in the Persian culinary uh, spectrum. It's very, very important. So in any case, all of this to say, um, feel what it is you're feeling in the moment and don't be afraid of running away. Don't, don't run away from those emotions. I'll never forget teaching inside of a psychiatric facility. Uh, I used to teach um, writing workshops inside of, and I've done this in other facilities as well, but I taught in one facility for a couple years in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I remember coming and I was taught every week and I came in one day and I went to the common room and there was a woman there who had just been admitted. She was new, she had just been admitted and she was crying. And I, she said, you know, what are you doing here? Because it's the common room, the TV's there, right? So the second, like, we have to turn off the TV, something is happening. Uh, and I said, oh, I come and I teach a writing workshop every week. Uh, you should stay. And she's still crying, right? And, and I know better than to ask, like, what's wrong? Like, you're going to say, like, I would be crying too. Why wouldn't you be crying? Um, so in any case, I said, I say to her, you should stay. And, and for, she's still crying, but she lights up for a minute and says, yeah, yeah, I'll do that, I'll stay. And one of the orderlies sees this and says, you can't stay unless you stop crying. And I lost it, <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? If you cannot cry in a psychiatric, like this is the world we're living in. You can't cry in a psychiatric facility, where the hell can you cry? And what she was doing is what her body was telling her to do. She was producing the best natural sedative that we have as human beings to create through crying. Um, and they, they were trying to steal that from her. Um, and that was in a facility that was supposed to treat her um, mental health, right? And they, they were actively harming it and saying, no, no, just take our drugs as opposed to, you know, this nat these natural tears that have zero side effects. Um, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with taking drugs. That's great if they help. Um, but also embrace the things that we naturally have and don't fight against those. And that, again, that's feeling the emotion and being able to cry is a gift, right? Um, which I think is something we should really try and remember right now because <laughs> uh, we're going through some really tough times. So um, all of this to say, the spiritual journey that was living and writing this book ultimately wasn't about finding something or running after something that I didn't have or finding something that wasn't here before. Um, instead, it was about realizing the thing that I was taking for granted, um, seeing something that was already within me and remains within all of us and from the start, right? The beloved. Uh, my favorite couplet, I'll end with this and then I'm excited to take your questions. My favorite couplet of, of Rumi's is uh, the Farsi I'll say first for anybody who speaks it as a little gift. Zar talab gashti khud aval zar budi which means you went out in search of gold far and wide, but all along you were gold on the inside. So ultimately the message I want you to take away is that you don't need me, you don't need Rumi even, wow. You don't need a book or a father as understanding as mine. <laughs> um, you don't need any of that to be whole. 
you are you were born this way. You're already whole, um, and not just whole, but gold, right? Um, precious. Uh, you're already all of that. Uh, you just need to slow down long enough to notice. I'm done. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, all right. So before we get to your questions, I wanted to get to my dad, who is uh, the mystery surprise for the evening, who will be joining us and reciting a poem uh, from the start of the Mass Navi, the, the opening of the Mass Navi known as the reed flute um, or the neigh. So he's going to read Beshnoaz Ne, this poem in Farsi, and then I'm going to read you the translation and then whatever questions you have, I'm really looking forward to them. I've seen, I have like the Zoom really shrunk, so I'm only seeing like little pop-ups and I'm excited to see what's actually there once I open it up. All right, Ahmad, turn on your video and this is uh, Dr. Ahmad Moisey is joining us um, from San Diego, California to read this poem. Uh, from the Mass Navi. You ready? I'm ready. Bethan. Vishnu az nei chun heka uyat mi konad, az juda uyha sheka uyat mi konad. Kaz nei istan ta umara ububridand, az nafiram marduzan naulidand. سینه ها هم شرح شرح از فراغ تا بگویم شرح درد اشتیاق هر کسی از زن خود شد یاغ من و از درون من نجست اسراغ من من به هر جمعیتی ناولان شدم جفت بدحالان و خوشحالان شدم هر کسی از زن خود شد یاغ من و از درون من نجست اسراغ من سر من از ناوله من دور نیست لیک چشم و گوش را آن نور نیست تن ز جان و جان ز تن مستور نیست لیک کس را دید جان دستور نیست آتش است این بانگ ناوی و نیست باد هر که این آتش ندارد نیست باد آتش عشق است کن در نی فتا جوشش عشق است کن در می فتا نی حریف هر که از یاری برید پرده هایش پرده های ما درید همچون ای زهری و تریاقی مجور همچون ای دمساز و مشتاقی مجور نی حدیث راه پرخون می کند قصه های عشق مجنون می کند محرم این هوش جز بیهوش نیست مر زبان را و مشتری جزگوش نیست. مرسی. مرسی. Thank you very much. That's my dad. خیلی ممنون. Um, I'm going to read the um, English, the translation from the book that I put together. So this is exactly what, um, what my father just read. And again, the start of the Mass Navi. Listen to how the reed flute sings its song, lamenting of a separation gone on too long. Ever since I was torn from the reed bed, my cry has multiplied and spread. I want a chest split open and apart to convey the pain that burns my heart. All those severed from their source yearn to return as a matter of course. In every gathering, I played my mournful hymn, consorting among the gleeful and the grim. All befriended me of their own accord, but they left my secrets unexplored. My greatest secret lives within this song, yet eyes and ears will get it wrong. Between body and soul, there is no separation. Nonetheless, the soul defies observation. 
The reed sings of those who've been torn from a friend, piercing their hearts so that they can ascend. It warns of a harrowing path, rich with blood, relating Majnun's tale of passion's flood. But the message of this melody stands classified, reserved only for those who in madness reside. Thank you. So weird having nobody like, thank you to nobody I can see. I wish I could see all of you. Thank you, Melody. That was beautiful. And I'd like to start the question by asking your dad to come back. Ahmed, can you come back um, on your video and audio? Hi, Dr. Moisey. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so I just wanted to start the questions with one to you, actually, as uh, Melody's father, who is both a medical doctor and a lover of this poetry, when she was going through this and you were visiting her in the hospital, did you go back and forth about which which was going to help her the most? I mean, did you did you know that Rumi was going to bring her through this in a, in a way that more than than the medical community would, or if you can share that? You know, it's such a difficult time of the life for a father to see somebody that you know, she is very smart, but it happens that at the age of 18 goes to eight, 10 hours of surgery and they took half of her pancreas out. So I have gone through a physical, emotional trauma with her, which it was very difficult. Most people, they die with that disease. And afterward, when I saw her to, that she has gone through a depression, I knew it for a much longer than my wife and my other daughter, which both of them are physician. And I knew and I told them that she's bipolar because I had a connection with her. I knew how she is. And uh, because knowing that he, she's bipolar that she didn't know and my family didn't accept, I tried to engage her with mysticism. And uh, the words that mean something, and it's not the word of every day that you buy something, you sell something, you go to university, you get educated. It was about something that it's not only about this world. There are things that they are much better that you can think about and brings happiness to you. And it doesn't have to relate to material. But because of that, I encouraged her. I encouraged her a lot to read about Rumi, poetry, and philosophy. Melody in undergraduate, her, she got her degree in philosophy. And after that, she went to law school and public health. So I knew it and I tried to decrease the problem, but unfortunately the medical, once we went to medical diagnosis, she was diagnosed with the wrong bipolar disorder which the treatment was not proper. But after we went through this, I think the medication that, and psychotherapy that she gets, and she's fantastic with that. She's very well informed. The other part that helps her to think that there is we are not alone in this world. Everything is within us and everybody loves us. And if we don't love somebody, it's only our problem. 
it's nobody else problem. Any hate, it's not because of somebody else. It's because my brain is not working. If I change my brain, I love everybody. And that's how we got along. We had our own fight too, and still we do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. We have a lot of questions and comments. Um, I will say, uh, Karen Harris writes, I do not know Farsi, but listening to your father, I feel tears come to my eyes. Like I remembered something on a soul level. Mm -hmm. Um, Rosina Merchant says that she really enjoyed this, that your story is very inspiring. And if you're just coming to Rumi, where would you start? Um, that's why I wrote this book. I'm hoping, <laughs> hoping you can start here. This is a very like low level, um, sort of get a broad sense of, of what Rumi uh, is all about. So if you're starting in, um, in English, and actually the book is being translated into Farsi right now. Um, so, inshallah, God willing, soon it will be avail available in Iran and in Farsi for those of us who speak it. Um, but I would say if you, if you just speak English, then uh, that's why I wrote the book is to help people um, come to Rumi. And then after that, there, there's a whole section in the back where I give some recommendations. Uh, there is a book by uh, a scholar at Duke, uh, Omid Safi, who actually brought uh, we went on a tour. My, my parents and I went on a tour to Konya with Omid. He's an Islamic scholar and incredibly knowledgeable about this stuff. He wrote a beautiful book called Radical Love, um, which uh, I highly recommend to get a broader sense of just Sufism. Uh, there's plenty of uh, translations uh, of Rumi's poetry. It turns out the most popular translator of Rumi's poetry in English is Coleman Barks. And he doesn't actually speak Farsi. He's, uh, he writes renditions. Um, and when I said sometimes the Islam is wiped clean from it, some of his translations may do that. My dad and I disagree on this. That's fine. Um, he's, he's a big fan. I'm also a big fan. I think he's a great poet in his own right. Um, but some of the translations to me feel pretty whitewashed. In any case, I would really recommend the translations by Javid Mojadedi, uh, who has finished translating four volumes of the Masnavi um, and he has managed to make them rhyme uh, which is the musicality of this poetry is really important the rhyming couplets so to be able to get them to rhyme uh, and, and to do it so beautifully like he does I, I highly recommend his translation if you're going to read the Masnavi I recommend uh, Mo, the Mojadevi uh, translation and he hasn't finished all the books yet I think there's two left and we have a question from Jack Swain about um, writing itself, the act of writing. And for you, that's such an important part of your life. And can you talk about it as a um, self-revelatory experience in itself? Mm, yeah. So it's weird to have something that is, feels, so my prayer is writing. That's like, that's how I make sense of the world. Um, and I pray maybe one time in the morning and that's it. Uh, but I feel like, but I also write every day. So this idea of uh, prayer through that makes a lot of sense to me because there are parts of this book uh, and in parts of every book I've written that very much do not feel like I wrote them. Um, the best parts are the ones that feel like somebody was writing it through me. And that's, that's the hope with all writing is that you can attach to that. Some people call it the muse. I call it the beloved. You can call it whatever you wanna call it, but there is a point for every artist at which you realize that it is not just you. It's the, somebody is doing something that is not just you. You're not alone in this. Um, and again, like plenty of writers are atheists, but they connect with nature. They connect with something that these labels separate us and Rumi is, totally against this idea of just uh, the label separating us. And I think when, when somebody like that maybe says like, oh, I, you know, I don't believe in any sort of divine force. I just, I say like cut open a cabbage. You know, do you believe in that cabbage? Have you ever cut open a cabbage and just looked at the inside? Forget about, I mean, my mom's a pathologist. So I have actually been to brain cuttings. So I think of when I see a cabbage, I think of a brain, but 
um, to see that that beauty and all those grooves inside of just a cabbage, a random, like uh, just a cabbage. I feel like there's, there's something bigger at play and whatever you call it, whether it's science or God or Christ or whatever you want to call it, uh, there's something there. And to me, that's what writing is, is just tapping into that something. And Zenat Lalani wonders if you could show some light on the poem entitled Your Way Begins on the Other Side. I don't, so Rumi's poetry doesn't have, um, if she wants to share the poem, they don't have titles. Um, I just saw, sorry, I just saw some, hi Carolyn. Um, <laughs> I just I saw, I hi, saw from the law school. I was like, hey, um, oh, that's so sweet. Um, so anyway, sorry. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that specific poem because I, I again, they don't have, um, in Farsi, often the English translations, this is one of the difficulties of finding the original Farsi. There's plenty of poems, in, in Farsi this happens too, quite honestly. There are several apocryphal poems in the book uh, that my dad loves, but that if you ask someone like Omid Safi, who's a scholar and it will tell you these are apocryphal poems. They're, they're probably not written by Rumi, um, but, they, they express the heart of his poetry. Uh, so I did include some of those apocryphal poems and I'm not saying this is an apocryphal poem, uh, but to think of a man who has 25,000 rhyming couplets just in one of his books uh, to be able to know and, and has no titles for any of them. There's no like title for the poems. Uh, it, it's hard to just know what poem you're talking about. So I'm not, I would love if you could uh, paste it or share it or email me afterwards. I would love to, I'm always interested in, in that. Um, and it might, and it might be apocryphal. I don't know, but it, it probably, hopefully, inshallah isn't. Um, yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> and then someone is commenting about a very famous quote from Martin Luther King that I see in signs around Decatur all the time now that is injustice anywhere threatens justice everywhere. Do you see this profound statement expressing lower or higher jihad, jihadi akbar, or are they holarchic? I apologize if I'm messing that up. And which sure. one pole transcends but includes the other? The latter, the latter for sure. I think they include one another. I think they're so intertwined. But as somebody who was, I mean, I was really good at the lesser jihad and really bad at the greater jihad. So um, I, and I mean, not horrible, but the better I became at one, the better I became at the other. So when I say there's two sides of the same coin, that's exactly what I mean, is I do think they're connected and it's not easy to like just parse them out like that. Um, I, I definitely think that. And then we have another question for your dad. Uh, Mr. Moisey, how did you connect to Rumi? How did it become such a, he become such an important part of your life? To be honest with you, I started Rumi because I wanted to become rich. <laughs> I was, uh, we were about six, seven years old, eight years old. My father used to tell us that I give you one penny, or let's say let's with this money, I give you two, three, four pennies to memorize this poem. But there was one condition with it that with each mistake, I take one penny away from you. And this is the fact. I started memorizing Rumi. At that time, I was not able to understand that. I started to memorize Sadi Rumi Hafez, the other poem, uh, poet in. Uh, Farsi language. And so by that memory that you have at that time, uh, I practically memorized hundreds and hundreds of maybe thousands of poems by heart. And not all of them I knew what I'm memorizing at age up to 11, 12 years old. And at the end, I did not become rich either because my mistakes was so much that after 100 uh, poem, the different poem that I memorized, I got maybe 
50 cents or one dollar. But you told me you never made any money. I, <laughs> because it was so interesting that we were six kids in the family. And he encouraged us with something that I give you this much money. And there was competition also. So we used to sit at the table and everybody say, you read it, you read it, you read it. And we started reading. And of course we had a mistake that he correct us. But at the same time that I was reading it, later on the others were reading it. Of course, at that age with that much brain power, I memorized everything that they were saying. So uh, it's uh, phenomenal that how many thousands of poems I memorized before even, it has nothing to do with school. And now I think that was the best present that my parents, they gave me. And you have passed that on. Yes. What a pleasure it has been to have both of you here tonight. I have to say, Mr. Moisey, this was a really special treat to have you join us and to have the two of you together and be able to witness this beautiful relationship. So thank you both. And I know that you're going to want to read this book. It came out in paperback last week and it is available at the Carlos Museum Bookstore um, at carlos.emory.edu. So please, um, Mark will be very happy to hear from you and we'll be happy to mail you the book or bring it to you on his bicycle if you live close enough to the museum. Uh, the museum is once again open to the public with safety precautions in place uh, and limited reservations. So do go to carlos.emory.edu and make a reservation to come and see Wondrous Worlds. And Melody and Mr. Moisey, thank you so very much for a beautiful evening. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you. Really Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.